here, uh, go from right to left, my right to left. And if you have things that you want us to address, could you just kind of quickly just run the list them, just sh shout them out. I'm just going to start over here. Anything you want us to talk about with decommodization, come on over here. Overproduction. Overproduction. What is decommodization? Timeline. Timeline for decommodization? Moving the needle. Moving the needle or transition? Is that all right? Yep. Okay. Finding markets. Finding markets. Business model for farmers. Business model for mid-sized farmers. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, again, my uh, amnesia's kicked in. I don't know who these guys are. So um, maybe uh, Sherry. We'll start with you. Who, who are you? Nice to meet you, Rob. I'm <laughs> Sherry Rogie Fiddler. I'm the new CEO at Family Farms Group. And I think you would like just a brief introduction. Yes, so please. I am a first and foremost a fifth generation farm owner and operator from Nebraska. I think we qualify as a mid-size farm. We are about 4,000 acres. We've been in and out of organic, and that is core to who I am. But I'm excited to be the new CEO of Family Farms because I think it gives me the chance to integrate some of my other experiences um, as an entrepreneur running an organic branded food company, so the branding piece, and with Boston Consulting Group on the strategy piece, and then leading an ag tech company on the digital piece. So excited to be here at, with you all, and also want to thank iSelect for our expanded partnership with Family Farms Group. So happy to be here. Excellent. Kelly. Hi there. Uh, my name is Kelly James. I'm the co-founder and CEO of an ag tech startup called Mercaris. We're market data and an online trading platform for organic and non-GMO, other IP uh, ag commodities. Uh, I can't claim an ag background. I grew up in an army family. My parents are not sure where I came from because the first thing I did when I was in high school was find my way to a cow-calf operation and get a job there after school and on, on summers and um, have been circling around working in the ag industry um, ever since. Drab. Cool. Uh, super glad to be here. I, I'm more excited about you guys then then me being up here talking I don't know what we're gonna talk about in a second but uh, I, a little bit about a little background about me uh, grew up ranch kid I have, I have 11 kids yes one wife um, one of my partners over there uh, and then my oldest son is over there so you'll see a few of us and then uh, but we have a couple different businesses or a bunch uh, we wanted to figure out how to actually make a living and be a farmer and sell the end product so along that journey over the past 20 some years, uh, we've been everything from organic meat and dairy to beverages and, and doing crazy geothermal uh, greenhouse dynamics with, with fruit. And, and now we have some uh, other different businesses we're working on. But the, the main thing is, is how do you make money in agriculture? And that's, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. And, uh, and then where do you sell it? And how oh, do you fund it? We're just doing intros. Okay. I, I'm cheating. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. He, 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 he was just going to try to slow me down. So. All right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, so, and I'm Rob Trice, the Mixed Bowl and Better Food Ventures. We focus on IT for food and agriculture, so we like to say from seed to stomach. I'm particularly excited about this panel because we, we've talked about or hit this topic a number of times. From our perspective, we're looking at how IT can, you know, uh, as John will tell you, we're living in a VUCA world where we have to assume volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It's an ever-changing world. How can we use IT to go inject more agility into our food system so that we can go meet change in supply and demand, societal needs, and so forth? And fundamentally, how can we take a macro food system and make it micro, and have make a micro system and make it macro? So those things that are doing good, we scale up, and those things that are general need to be more personalized. So one thing, though, that uh, we were talking about uh, backstage was, uh, with all due respect to the iSelect funds, we didn't really like the name of this panel. And it gets to the question that we had about here about what is decommoditization? And uh, Kelly, you want to take that one? I'll, I'll start. And I know this is a, we're going to all jump in here. But so I, I will start with the, as an economist, uh, economics background, the word commodity just means that it's a, it's a raw material that's an undifferentiated type of good. It's fungible. So if I'm growing a number two yellow corn, um, I can deliver it or someone else can deliver it. There's a specification that the market has accepted, a standard out there, um, and they can be you know, traded back and forth. And so that's, that's really what a commodity is. So a lot of these 
Uh, I know in the program it listed all sorts of things like peas and a few other things. Those are still, by my definition, by the economic definition, they're still commodities. They're just niche commodities. The notional value might be smaller than the U.S. corn crop if you're going to go into yellow pea, but it still obeys the laws of supply and demand. Um, you know, 10 years ago, we, when we, before we had this revolution in alternative proteins, uh, you still had some guys, some people growing yellow peas. Now, with you know Ripple and Beyond Meat and everyone else wanting yellow pea protein, well, demand has skyrocketed. So you've seen the accompanying rise in price. I guarantee you, five years from now, other farmers will have noticed that the, the growing yellow pea is a good deal, and the market will do what it does. The old saying is, nothing cures high prices like high prices, or low prices like low prices. More people will come into the market, and you will have an adjustment of price, and we'll be talking about how no one can break even on yellow pea, and there's an oversupply, and you know all this and that. So I would first say that any of those micro or, or those niche crops that we're talking about are, in fact, commodities. Yeah, and I'm thinking about almond glut in California right now. Travis, anything to add on that one? No, I agree. And that, we were talking about a little backstage, like what, what crops can be grown and what makes sense. And uh, we were talking about chickpeas. Uh, we were talking, so we, we sell the restaurant industry. That's our main focus for beverages. And uh, we had several restaurants recently that reached out to us like, hey, you guys are farmers. Um, where do I get chickpeas? And like you guys are like, I'd love to sell some chickpeas. Like those are easy, right? So uh, it comes back to how do we gap it? The same people were also like, Oh, by the way, I like to have a phone where I can click on the chickpea and I know exactly you know, what square foot it came from and how it got there. So those are all things that are, you know, these are this is what we're trying to figure out the gap of. Yeah. Sherry, anything on that decommodization? I'll try to be brief, but yes. So I would just add two more dimensions to the definition of a commodity. I agree with raw material and fungible, but I would add widely available mm -hmm. and uniform. And then also the assumption behind decommoditization is that that's the goal. And I think there are pros and cons of commodities, and I think we have to understand that. The language we use is more value capture and differentiation, which I think is probably more along the lines of what we'll be talking about yeah. here. Yeah. So uh, that clip from Indigo was great uh, because those of you who know me, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, it only was, I think, when Indigo announced their intention to do a partnership with AB and Bev to put their microbial products into my beer can that I really understand why they needed hundreds of millions of dollars. And we heard it here. There are 11 different business models that they have. So what Indigo at its heart is trying to do is if you'll allow me, decommoditize um, a commodity or create a special commodity by taking that microbial product and getting that all the way through into my beer can. And so what I wanted to do is explore with you guys, what are the elements of that value chain? What are, what do we think those 11 different business models are? And um, it's really just adding value, right? Yeah. So th that's what they did. They just added value to something that you guys are already doing in a way that made it look cool and people pay more money for it. But in order to make that happen, there's some key elements. So if you look at Indigo, for instance, they're not only a microbial product, they needed to go create on tote storage for their producers. They need to go create a logistic system. They need to go create that marketplace on the demand side. Uh, and, I, you know, and what else have they got? They got a, a bunch of other things that are all key to taking that, that product and get it into my beer can. And Kelly, maybe I could just ask with you to kind of look at those elements of that uh, specialized commodity value chain. You provide two very critical things to get started information in the marketplace. That's right. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say, look, we're well into the information age. And, you know, information is, is critical. And when I say information, my gosh, that can mean all sorts of things. Um, I'll leave the sort of agronomy questions to the, the folks who are the experts in the audience, the, the growers and the extension agents. Um, but when we talk about information, it's, it's, the, it's the economics, it's the financial information, it's the um, what am I going to get for my crop? Like, how do I how do I structure a contract? Um, is it cost plus? Is it you know you're trying to manage your risk? So so sharing the, um, the capturing the value and sharing the any revenue that's that generated is an important part of this. But then managing the risk because you know commodities themselves are in a strange way are also a way of managing risk. I mean, if you know that this is you know here's the foreign material, here's the moisture, here are these standard things. The growers can go out there and grow to that spec with some assurance that what they grow will, in fact, be taken and they'll be paid for their efforts. Um, the other thing, mitigating though, risk, right? Right, exactly. It's the it's the sharing of, of risk. If you um, and the sharing of value and the sharing yeah. of value. 
Um, if Indigo is, is, is doing, building all this, you know, the other infrastructure that needs to happen, there's a couple of other folks out here that are doing really some innovative things in that as well. There's, there, you've got to have a segregated supply chain. If you're trying to communicate the benefit to the customer of, you know, a high oleic or an organic or a non-GMO, or then you've got to have a way of keeping it out of the larger, you know, stream of, of everything else. So that needs to be built, and then of course connecting the, the, the buyer and the seller so that those demand signals can get all the way back through the chain um, to, the, to the grower. And sure, just look at it, I mean, what Family Farm does, you're, you are working on behalf of your grower network to find those buyers, right? That's part of what we do, yes, and, and I should have said at the outset a, a definition of Family Farms Group. So Family Farms Group is a farmer value network focused on value, and focused on delivering business solutions for farm families. And whether it's Indigo or any other business model, for it to be sustainable, it has to be enough value capture at the farm level for it to work. And I think that's a question mark still for Indigo and for all of us to keep, keep focusing on how can we help that be sustainable for the farmers. By the way, I would say that the only people who like competition, perfect competition, are economists. No one else, as a business owner, right? <laughs> I, I don't want to compete with, you know, I want to be the only one in the room. Or, you, you know, if you as a grower have something, you don't want everybody else jumping in the market. So competition is this thing that is like a great ideal, but in the dog-eat-dog -dog world of business, you may not really want it. But I will say this, um, the sort of benefit of doing something where you've got a buyer that's willing to pay you money for something and you, you are tailoring your operation to their demand has got, can come with some great premiums. It can also come with some risk, right? Like if you reorient your business to serve this customer and then that customer goes away and you've made some you know, capital investments or you know, time and, and energy, you, it's risky, it can be risky. So there's always, a, there's always a cost benefit that has to be done with any of these types of arrangements. Well, education, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. I think this is a perfect time to connect, like I select was saying that yesterday was the day of con the consumer and today's kind of the day of the farmer. And what I think we ultimately have to do is connect that all. And, and that is what we're trying to do at Family Farms Group is to connect our farmers to the market, where the market is going, and to try to create that shared value across the value chain. And we're looking at the whether it's decommoditization or value capture by looking at the who, what, when, where, why, and how the food is grown, and to use technology as an enabler for that. With blockchain, we, we've heard that about that today, and using that to help connect from the farm to the consumer. That's exactly right. And as it relates to venture, uh, I, haven't, I haven't memorized the ag funder numbers for 2018, but in 2017, we had 10 billion invested in agri-food tech, if you will. Uh, we had six billion, which was for food tech, food delivery, let's just call it POS and beyond. We had three billion that actually went on farm, uh, up to the farm gate. We only had one billion, this is a scientific term, our, our team uses the messy middle of food. That's from farm gate to POS. Only 10% of venture funding for food and ag went into that space. And that's exactly what I think we need to do to help on the specialized commodity or decommodization is create that linkage, a stronger linkage between you know, uh, field and port, if you will, right? Travis, I got a question for you. Can we talk Slurpees? Yeah, man. How the heck do you get your Slurpees in the 7-Eleven? Well, nobody else has thought about doing an organic Slurpee. Like, you can think about organic filet mignon, like, everybody wants to do that, right? But it's not really, like, sexy or groovy or, or something you would even think about to make something that's full of stuff that you don't really want your kids to have. But when, you're, when you have 11 kids and you're in a gas station and you're like, and then your kids are like, I want that red stuff. And you're like, no, <laughs> right? Then you're like, wait a minute, there's an opportunity in that. So you just dig in, you're like, whoa, there's huge opportunity because that's a profit center for that gas station that may not have gas and they've still got to have that customer coming in. How do we take somebody that loved it when they were a kid and won't let their kid have it and make it so that they will. What mom won't let their kid have an organic cucumber slushy that has half the sugar? Right. Okay, but you're sitting there in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, mm -hmm. right? How the heck are you getting turmeric and the ingredients? I'm assuming you're not making this on your farm, right? How no. did you find 7-Eleven? How did you stitch together that value chain? Granted, you've got a smaller and more compact value chain than what Indigo's got, but how did you actually make that happen. So it's, I mean, it's 20 years of R&D on everything from meat to dairy. You learn where to get ingredients globally. And, I mean, obviously you're not going to get 
turmeric in Idaho, uh, but you might be getting it in the Caribbean or you know, Egypt, and there's different ingredients come from all over the world. We only do organic, so it's, we have there are a few organic players that it used to be that you only had a small amount. Now there's a surplus of organics in certain herbs and different spices, and, and that's where it comes back to the so added value. You, did you just Google it? I mean, you're like organic turmeric. Yeah, or we were already using it because we. Or you knew them, or yeah, it's. Uh, we go to trade shows all over the world. We understand uh, which farmers are selling into different different traders, or we might, you know, we might end up finding the farmers. Some of them hunt us down. And people call us like, "Hey, I've got like you're a farmer." Uh, they're like, "Hey, I've got this Seville orange, and I don't know what to do with it, but I've got thousands of acres of this stuff, and nobody else wants to buy it." Like, um, or they're like, "Hey, it's or, it's you know, there's other people who are interested, but we'd rather put it in your products." How does that work? But so what we do is we really. We, as I'm formulating products, we really make sure there's enough of it first. And then we get to a point where we're like, well, we're in every state and we're going to five countries. Probably should make sure there's extra. So one of our things we looked at was uh, vanilla. In Madagascar, it got wiped out. So we're paying 600 bucks a pound for vanilla. And I'm like, crap, I'm a farmer. I'm like, I wonder how hard it'd be to grow vanilla, right? Like it, most corn guys are like not thinking about how to grow vanilla. But I'm like, but if you're paying 600 bucks a pound, that's your number one most expensive ingredient in your cola, you're gonna think about it. You get a chain that has 2,000 stores and all of a sudden you're gonna buy most of the organic vanilla. So I started chewing on like, how do we grow vanilla? I'm like, well, looks like we're gonna have to do it in a greenhouse in Idaho with bananas and coffee because it just happens to make sense. Oh, wouldn't that be sweet? We can make our own coffee out of that too. So it kind of, you're gonna evolving in that. It's not like one crop that you do. We have like 60 some ingredients and just four of our drinks. So I got a tip for you though. Yeah. You could have used a digital tool. Oh, it could have auction on with Karis. Absolutely. Well, for <laughs> tumor, right? Yeah. yeah, so I will say there's a function of just matching up, you know, buyers and sellers that, that we have. But, oh, yeah. but I will say, you know, your operation is, is so unique. I'm a big believer that there is a space for everybody or there should be in this, you know, economy. There are there's a grower out there that's like, look man, I don't Really, I got to grow vanilla in a greenhouse. Like that's like crazy, um, and they may not capture the value you're capturing. They might not have the headaches, and they might have a few less gray hairs than you have too. Um, so you can outsource that and just have realistic expectations then about how much value you capture. There's a company here. I'll just give one shout out um, called Pipeline Foods, and you know they are part of that middle piece that has gotten some of that investment. That has been, you know, sorely lacking in, in some of these these spaces, um, and you know, you don't have to be. There's sort of a competitive advantage of saying, you know, this is what I'm good at. I'm going to focus on this. I don't necessarily have the, the the sort of bandwidth to do what you're doing, but I still want to create a good business and capture some of the value and grow a crop that the consumer is demanding. And, and those there are companies like that that will at least take part of that piece for you and, and figure out the processing or some of the other Yeah, and that's a good cue, actually. I told Eric Jackson, are you here, Derek? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Can we get a mic runner just to go stand next to Eric and make sure he doesn't leave the room? Because when we start q and I want him to, to I, I told him this was coming, too, uh, because what he's doing is, is pretty important. We need, we need to hear from him on this discussion uh, for sure. Uh, how are you doing that matching between buyers and your network and are you using we, we partner with pipeline we partner with Macaris on the go. organic side of things but um, our old way of doing it was on the phone and our new vision is technology enabled so we're building a digital platform and we're building partnerships with blockchain to do that connection our vision is that it's not just the crops that you grow for the value capture it's all the business processes, our standardized data sets across our farms, and then the branding, the feel-good branding piece of that you're buying from a family farms group. So the idea is that, that food companies and buyers could come to our group, buy it through our platform, and then have that whole data set that goes along with it so that all of that is part of that value capture, not just what we're growing. Um, what about financing to the point about transitions, right? Going from a commodity, well, let's call it a specialized commodity or a value-add product. And when you were talking about growing avocados in Idaho and you went into a bank, did they just think you were loco? Yeah, you can. They're not going to give you money for that, right? Like a, <laughs> that's like a 12-year-old trying to get a restaurant loan. 
So what well, did you go fund me? Well, how, how did you make those? No, out? that's we, you just have to do it yourself. Like, and, and if you're a farmer, you're you know there's some risk or reward, and you're gonna have to put some money into something. It's not a bank based deal. So you're gonna have to go out on your on a limb on some things and then prove it. Once you proved it, then you have tons of people want to get to be to get a piece of it because you've just done something nobody else has done, and it's more interesting. What about uh, financing? Have you guys seen other unique models in terms of people? A GoFundMe campaign or something to, to do that value add production? Well, so I would say that, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but the, the data is important. We've had, I can't tell you how many either farmers or, you know, small, mid sized food processing companies say, look, my banker does not understand. I'm going to do this crop or reorient my, my, and then look at, here's the returns I'm expecting. So a lot of times we'll step in and say, no, they're not making this up. Like, here's you know five years of data on what they can expect to get for this. So here's a short range forecast on what the market is is doing, and that sometimes helps alleviate some of those fears that you know Travis is not just crazy. Well, maybe he he's is. crazy in other ways, but um, but there are some hard numbers to back this up, and you can raise money off of that those types of, of numbers. There but there's all sorts of things. I'll, uh, Sherry's probably the, the seen all sorts of ways that the buyer will connect and help finance the grower through transition too. I just say grants are another way for okay. some of these types of things. Um, we feel like for the farmer of the future to succeed, there are four things they need, access to land, access to capital, access to innovative innovation and innovative business models, and then access to value-added markets. And we try to help them with the access to capital, um, and we are connected with a variety of innovative companies that are out there, but then also tap into the grants. Um, so the, we're going to kick it off uh, Q and A here shortly, but I, I gave you guys a scenario that scares me, keeps me up at night. Uh, I'm just going to call it uh, decommoditize or die, right? If you look at the fact that Costco is now going to grow 100 million chickens in Nebraska on their own, Walmart has their own dairy in Indiana, and they're sourcing from 200 miles and chopped off the contract with Dean Foods. You look at Amazon. Uh, and what they're doing with Prime, in most of those instances, what you're seeing is retailers, we're, we've been focused mostly on how can the grower actually add value, but now we're actually seeing the retailers also step in to the production chain, up the production chain. And in each one of those cases, I mean, I would argue Costco wants me to go to the back of their store, which is where their chickens are, and fill my cart with all sorts of crappy stuff. Uh, but they're getting me to go to the back of the store. Walmart knows I'm going to go to uh, a store and expect milk, right? That's a, uh, something that I expect to have. And then from an Amazon perspective, you're seeing the blend, Prime, Whole Foods, Amazon Online. Is food going to become a lost leader, right? In which case we have irrational economic actors producing commodities. In which case, if you are an independent commodity producer, you have to decommoditize or die. Maybe I'm being a little dramatic there, but what what do you think of that scenario? I have lots of thoughts, but I, you yeah, have a thought bubble, a tough Kelly. One. So <laughs> it's a tough one. I mean, even like we'll take organic dairy for a second because pay prices for organic milk had held up, you know, pretty well, and they're still higher than conventional. But you know, we're losing the small, you know, 80, 100 cow dairies to the you know 2,000 cow dairies that are supplying exactly. you know Walmart. It's hard. I don't think we've solved that problem yet. Um, you know, the, they're going to push all the risk onto the, onto the farmer, onto the individual producer. And so, you know, maybe, you know, the farm, I don't want the farm of the future to be where we're all sort of sharecropping for, you know, one or two giants. But um, I, we, we've got to figure out how to fix that. I, I wish I had an answer, and I, I don't. Um, yep. Yeah. I, I, I'm not that worried about it. I mean, you look at uh, one, one, chick, one chicken that's in Costco, not everybody even has a Costco in their town. Uh, like if you're here, I don't even know where there's Costco close to Memphis. Is there, is, is there one? Uh, like, no, but there's Amazon. There's, there is. So you get your of, drone delivered chicken. But uh, <laughs> so, so that, that comes at that's another deal that so the, the entire market's about to shift and change uh, quite a bit. A grocery store is going to go from thirty thousand square foot to about eight. Middle of store is subscription. You're going to get your your toilet paper and your razors and your shampoo delivered every month because you know how much you use diapers, whatever. And uh, and then there's certain things you're just not going to get. You're not going to get ice cream through Amazon. It does not work. You can't get meat very well through Amazon. There are going to be certain staples. You can't. It, it's not cost effective to get your milk that way. 
And uh, there, so there's going to be the commodity, yes, they, they have their own dairies and their own big facilities, but there's still going to be a niche of super high quality and then transparency. If you can have transparency, and this is what I want to tell all the farmers is, uh, a lot of my friends that are, that are throwing out the transparency dynamic, they're like, come to my farm, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Because I don't see that I'm doing anything wrong. If you can see that I'm doing something wrong, then tell me. And people, they shut up and they just don't come. They're like, oh, I guess you're not hiding anything, then we're good. So what it comes down to is there's gonna be a point where transparency is gonna be good. And then they're gonna be like, well, the big companies aren't necessarily gonna show us transparency. They might show us some marketing, but will they? And that's where it comes back to the small guy being able to be more transparent is going to be a long-term benefit. Now, there's also going to be a, a convenience store dynamic, you know, less less gas, yeah. more electric. How's that going to affect that entire chain? Yeah. So you're going to see the convenience store and the big store come into just one store. Well, I'll tell you. I just, one, oh, great. Yeah. I would just. I don't think it's necessarily decommoditize or die, but I think that kind of makes a point. And I think the commodities aren't going to go away. Commodity farmers aren't necessarily going to go away, but huge consolidation over time. And from our perspective, we want to help keep family farms alive and thriving in the U.S. So if we want to keep roughly the same number or decrease a little bit, then there have to be other strategies for the other, other family farms, yep. which means they do have to look for other value capture opportunities, not in commodities. Yep. Kelly? Yeah, I was also just going to say that you find this, you know, scaling things is really hard. It's, you know, organic started out as this counterculture thing and now like if you ever want to see just like sit back and shake your head at the drama go to one of the organic standards meetings where it's people are duking it out over what's allowed what practices how do you treat your animals and part of the answer I mean as much as it can get a little silly um, part of the answer is making sure that you do have strong standards because one of the reasons organic costs more is that what they, and sometimes the input costs are lower but it is it can be hard to scale it with some of those uh, procedures. When you have um, the uh, pasture rule, um, that, that's, a, that's not easy. I mean, people have figured out ways to do it and there's constantly kind of pushing at the, the edges. But if you keep uh, some of the regenerative standards strong, there's a movement to make organic even, you know, this rege regenerative, regenerative organic. Part of that, I think, is a way to differentiate themselves from the crowd, the sort of corporate organic. And um, I will not say whether I agree with that. I actually do think the consumer might get a little confused about different labels. But um, keeping, having a process and keeping the standards clear um, and applicable to everyone and strong is one way of making sure that the playing field is even, that you know, in every other area of the economy, what you see is you know, big companies, big, big actors have undue influence when it comes to the rules and regulations. And to the extent possible, if we can make sure that that is not um, repeated for organic, that will help make, keep the playing field level for, for everyone. Yep. Do we have a mic by uh, Eric Jackson? Where is he? Eric, very briefly, can you tell us about Pipeline and how you're going to save the day at scale? <laughs> well, I mean, we're doing uh, probably the least sexy part of agriculture. You, you, you referred to it as a messy metal. And the opportunity that we saw was that there was um, a lack of investment going into midstream handling for primarily for organic grains. So even while the demand has grown and the acres continue to increase, um, the infrastructure to efficiently move products, um, condition, clean, process, blend, grind, sort, do all that stuff that nobody ever really sees to get that product into a form, whether it can be fed to animals or, or go on into the, the human food chain. Um, those dedicated assets uh, are still largely absent in, in, in the organic space. So you know, we talked about this connection between like what, what, like what Sherry's team is doing, right? And then you have the CPGs over here. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the middle. And to try to say that uh, growing grain uh, space of any sort can get by without having those middle pieces put together um, just means that the, the, the whole system is not going to grow as fast as it possibly could. So we came in with the idea that um, if we can put a, put a, you know, a war chest together of money, um, we can take people with uh, high skill levels from, from the supply chain world in agriculture and point them towards uh, solving a problem that was solved in the conventional space 50, 60, 70 years ago and help this market to scale quick, more quickly. And so we put CapEx in and it lowers OpEx on a per unit basis. That's why you put CapEx into anything, is to lower OpEx on a per unit basis. 
and the market's getting big enough now that it can it, it can absorb and, and it demands more investment than we've been able to put in. We're about 140 million in over the last two years. Um, the market's got a lot more room for growth. So we're doing the, the, the least glamorous part of all of this. You know, we're, we're, we're not as visible as, as Kelly's team is, for example, because we're just not, we're not across the marketplace like that. We serve right now Saskatchewan, North Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. Uh, we've got an operation in Argentina. Um, we're focused on the heavy concentrations of organic production in North America primarily and then moving that product more efficiently um, instead of loading a truck at a farm and trying to truck it across country. Good. Uh, we're running out of time here. I want to, those folks that yelled out, did we, did we get to your questions? I'll kind of do that scan again. Raise your hand. I can see if we didn't answer your question. Do you want to scan? Anybody else? Where's that? Go ahead. Can we just yell it out? Yeah, it was overproduction. Overproduction. Well, you talk well about that a I would say there is an overproduction. It's just the price will fall. You know. So overproduction is a is a it's just where the supply and demand curve meet, and there you have price. So you know the, your price signals tell you, hey, I'm going to get into something, or you have weather favorable weather conditions. Everybody's in the same position; they're getting great yields, and then all of a sudden you have more supply than you maybe predicted, and yet demand hasn't shifted. You're kind of working on this, and so what happens is you see price fall. It's not necessarily that it's overproduction; it's just that price is reflecting the where the supply and demand curves meet. Um, if you're, I'm, I'm assuming for your own operation, you, you just want to watch and see, does that mean, you know, is this a long-term thing? Do I feel like this is going to be a multi-year trend? You, you, have to, you have to make some decisions then about whether you want to stay in a market that you perceive as having the price low because supply, you know, supply exceeds, you know, the demand, the growth and demand. One thing about the supply and demand on the organic that I've seen that's kind of been kind of interesting is uh, with meat, you haven't seen the organic go up near as much. Uh, they're obviously natural. There's been a big deal in that. Uh, dairy has it kind of capped out. But what we found in, in the food service industry is they're reluctant to say, yes, I want to go organic until like they're, you, know, you got the beginning of the adoptive curve and you got all the hipsters and the, the cool restaurants that want to do it or the, the beginners. Then you get up to the top and they're kind of waiting to see how you do. But kind of giving you a little background you know, around, these are approximate dates, not exactly. 2003, Whole Foods, the number one organic buyer in the world. Uh, 2008, Safeway Vons takes over as, as the number one organic um, buyer and seller in the world. Costco takes over soon after that. Is that what Costco? Uh, I see 7-Eleven as being one of the biggest organic sellers by 2022. Like, so it's it's coming. So what happens is, is you don't have 7-Eleven saying, I'm going to have organic stuff. So. It's uh, and you don't exactly know, but I can tell you this: that based on our experience in the restaurant industry and and food service in general and college universities, if everybody's asking for it and all the new buyers are demanding it, or at least demanding transparency or regenerative or clean, they may not even know what that is. We need to have it figured out so when they're ready to buy, we can all capture some gain on on a profit on all that. Travis, the one thing I would add to that timeline is Thrive Market. And I don't know if you know Thrive Market uh, raised $100 million in LA and within 18 months became the largest online uh, marketplace for organic and non-GMO goods. They curate that to a rabid base of folks that may not have a Whole Foods in their town. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's an important milestone as well. Okay, anybody else? We got maybe I got one. Yeah. Yep. So will, will grain production become consolidated like other? 
Who wants to take that one? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it started in some areas already. I mean, if you look at organic dairy, or, organic valley's got like something like 40%, maybe a little more of the fluid milk market. Um, you know, certainly well, that my point about competition stands, like nobody wants competition in their corner of the world. You know, Eric is trying to conquer the world for uh, the organic middle. Um, so, there, so that is, it's, it's something that I think is part of the dynamic of capitalism. Um, I would say that, you know, for things like organic grain, I would also say, everyone remember the example of the uh, sterling essence, I'll, I'll throw some Chicago examples in there. Everyone who tries to corner a market eventually, you know, many times comes to Greece. So think about the silver, the, the, the sterling, uh, the, the brothers that tried to corner the silver market. You know, corn, number two yellow food grade corn, is a lot of people can use it. So you don't actually even need a monopoly to make a really great, successful business. And I would say that market is going to you know, stay pretty fragmented. But yeah, if you're in a draw area, if you're a grower in a draw area for a big, you know, for, a, for an elevator, I mean, you, you, you kind of have a relationship with that elevator. I mean, it doesn't make sense to, or it might not make sense, hopefully it doesn't make sense that you're going to truck it across the country somewhere else. So you want some options right there locally in your, in your area. And I know we. I know we don't have a lot of time. I'm happy to follow up more afterwards. Family Farms Group was actually founded on that original idea that consolidation was going to happen quite rapidly in the grain sector. It hasn't happened as rapidly as the original founders thought, and there's all kinds of reasons why that is. So I'm happy to follow up. But we do think it will still consolidate more than it is at the moment. But there are a variety of barriers to that uh, speed of consolidation. So happy to follow up more. Excellent. I think on that note, we should probably call it a day. Um, Sherry, Kelly, Travis, thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you for contributing your questions as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. And great thanks to Travis and Kelly, Sherry, and Rob for moderating. And now we have, I'm going to say it right this time, a 14 and a half minute networking break, which means you'll be back in your seats at 1.40 at 2 o'clock because we have two potent sessions to end our uh, main session today. I don't think you want to miss one of them is on where is the exit? Biotech? Food? Ag tech? Mm, what do you think? And some closing remarks. So be, please be back in your seats at 2 p.m. <laughs>